All right, we're, uh, we started reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, but I want you to just go back a little bit into chapter 5, because obviously chapter 6 is a continuation, chapter 5, same thought, and I want to get just a little bit further context into what we're just reading and for the sermon tonight. We're going to start reading in verse number 17 in chapter number 5. The Bible reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Continuing on in chapter 6. We then as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And the title of my sermon this evening is, Now is the Day of Salvation. Amen. And I'm going to hit this from a few different angles. This is really important. First of all, obviously, now is the day of salvation for anybody who is unsaved. Right? If there's anyone in this room this evening that is unsaved, that doesn't know 100% for sure that you're going to heaven when you die, then I urge you and beseech you to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and not to put it off. When you, you, this is not one of those things that you, you should be going, well, I'm going to think about it later. Or I'm going to deal with this later. This is something that ought to be dealt with today, that ought to be dealt with now. And this is something that we ought to be you know, remembering, especially when we're out soul winning with people. There's a fine balance and a lot of learning that goes along with giving the gospel to people, but we should always be trying to improve on our soul winning techniques. We don't want to come across, across as jerks or arrogant or pushy necessarily with people, right? We, we want to be tactful. We want to communicate with people so as to... to have them be as receptive as possible. But simultaneously, at the same time, we understand how important this stuff is and we need to try to express that to people as much as is possible, you know, without just completely turning them away. But oftentimes, too many times, we have a lot of people that will come to the door and say, well, I'm, I'm busy or whatever. And often, and they just don't, and usually they're not doing anything or they're playing video games or something like that. We need to do our best, and again, use tact, but to try to urge people, you know, now is the day of salvation. Amen. Like, this is not something that you should take lightly and, and just blow off. Now, if they're going to blow you off, oftentimes they're just, they're going to do it anyways. But to do our job the best, we need to express this is really important. You know, this isn't something that... that you, you may not even have time to come back to it later, and if you do, you probably, you probably won't anyways. I saw that last week, the story of the, the, the parable of the sower and the seed. You know, when you sow the seed in someone's heart, you know, and they don't receive it and they don't believe, then Satan comes away and takes the seed that was sown. And when Satan's taking that seed out, they're not going to be thinking about it again. You know, it's just, it's just probably not going to happen. And, for good, and, and that's why Satan wants to take it away so that they don't believe and get saved. The urgency of salvation needs to be something that we're continually reminded about. It, it can be easy to fall into routine. It can be easy to fall into habit. And look, if you got a habit of soul winning, amen. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good habit to have. We should all have that habit and, and that routine. But it, it can become then real easy to just make, just have that be kind of something you do and, and less real as far as thinking about, man, these are real people. This is really important. This needs to be dealt with and it needs to be dealt with sooner rather than later. Now, obviously that is the same truth for everybody. When we go out to the door, these are people you've never met before. And 
you might not have another contact with them again anyways, which is why it's all the more important for them to choose that now is the day of salvation for them. But there's not a whole lot we can do different in that regard. I mean, we could, we could try just a little bit more to say, hey, you know, can, I, can you just, I mean, do you have one minute? Can I just show you one verse? You know, we could do our best to, to just try to get them to listen a little bit and hopefully pique their interest enough to continue talking. But where this becomes more important, I believe, for us as, as believers is, uh, and for soul winners especially, is when it comes to your family and friends. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Because all too often, we can be very willing to go out and just talk to strangers all day long. But when it comes to your own family, well, I'll deal with that another time. Well, I don't know if it's the right time. Well, I'm, I'm going to put that off. Well, I don't want to upset that. You know, there's, for whatever reason, there's personal reasons, there's all these other things come up that would never come up if you were just talking to a stranger. And look, we've all been there. I've been there. But I, I want to urge you to understand the importance of getting things done right away. And usually these things hit home once somebody's passed away. Because that's final. That's it. There is no more chance for that loved one to get saved once they die. And we don't know when that day is going to be. And that's why we don't want to just put things off for tomorrow, what needs to be done today. Um, keep your place here in 2 Corinthians, if you want to turn real quick to James. A very, very famous uh, verse in James 4, James 4, 14. I'll, I'll read it for you. You can turn there if you'd like. We're going we're to do some more reading in 2 Corinthians, though. Uh, James 4, 14 says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And this is in response to people who are saying, oh yeah, today, or tomorrow, we're going to go off, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, it's going to be great, and next week, or next year, I'm going to talk to my loved one, I'm going to talk to my brother, I'm going to talk to my uncle, I'm going to talk to whoever it is, and I'm going to give them the gospel, and you've got these plans that are way out in the future, and you know what, sometimes that day never comes. Because our life is a vapor. A vapor lasts a very short time. You exhale in the winter. I don't even know if it happens here that much, but when you go somewhere cold and you exhale in the winter, right, the vapor, you can see the vapor out of someone's mouth from the warm breath hitting the cold air and it, it disappears in seconds. That's what the Bible is equating our life to. We think of a lifetime often as being a long time. It's not. It's not. It really isn't. It's a short, it's a short amount of time that we have on this earth. And more than that, it's variable for everybody. Some children die in the womb. Some children die at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, pick any number you want. Any amount of number of seconds that you have breath in this worth. We never know what's going to happen. Sometimes there's people you think they're going to die tomorrow. Or they're in the hospital. They miraculously heal and get better and they continue living for many years. There's other people that are in perfect health, never been a day, sick a day in their life, drop dead at 40 years old, 30 years old, whatever. Completely unexpected. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know. Which is all the more reason to get done today. The gospel to my Bible Now is the day of salvation. Don't let it pass. You know, a good friend of mine had someone pass recently. Unexpected. Didn't know it was going to happen. We had an opportunity to give the gospel from out of town, happened to be there, right time, and didn't let that opportunity pass. And this, this means all of the world for that person that passed away. Because had he not taken that opportunity to give the gospel and would have just let any other reason come up, I'm busy, I've got this going on, well, it doesn't really seem right, I don't want to give the gospel, and just ignored that, and didn't give the gospel, that same person would probably be burning in hell right now. I mean, it's, it, we need to be reminded from time to time how important this is. 
I can't think of how many times in my own life where, where I've, I've come this close to just dying. And I think about the times before I was saved. Man, our lives could be so fragile and who knows? Who knows what a day is going to bring? I love hearing the stories where the person gets saved before they die, but you know what? You don't want to be in the situation where you did pass up that opportunity. You had the perfect chance to give someone the gospel and you chose not to do it and then you find out that person. That is a heavy weight to bear. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Don't let that pass you by. Keep that in your mind regularly. Now is the day of salvation. When you're considering, I don't know, should I give this person the gospel? Now is the day of salvation. It doesn't always work out. But now is the day. Right now. It's the opportunity. Well, any opportunity you have, that is the opportunity you need to use. Because you cannot count on another opportunity coming up. You can't count on it. You can't rely on it. Hopefully it does come up. If they do reject, if you don't get a chance, if something doesn't work out the way you want it to, but you're attempting to give the gospel, there's nothing more you can do about it. But you don't want to have to look back when someone's already passed on and go, man, I had an opportunity. Why didn't I just stop what I was doing and give them the gospel? Why didn't I just do that? It's sad. You don't want to be in that situation. Let's continue reading here. Uh, well, let's go back in 2 Corinthians. In chapter 5, in the context here, we're seeing how we have been given this job of, of being ambassadors for Christ. Because when Christ was on this earth, the Bible says in verse 19, excuse me, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. That's what Jesus was doing. He was preaching the gospel to people. But Christ isn't walking this earth anymore. He says he's committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Jesus did the work for the reconciliation to happen. To reconcile sinners against the Holy God and to bring them to Him. And, Je and now that Jesus isn't here, He's saying, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you, basically Himself, that, that God is the one pleading with you. God's just using us now to plead with you to be reconciled unto God. You're a sinner. You need to be made right with God. Now is the day. Don't pass this up. You are not right with God until you get saved. And you need to get saved because you don't know what day you're going to meet your maker. Don't know. It says, be ye reconciled. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That he might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, in chapter 6, we're going to start reading also the importance that we play as these workers, as these ambassadors on the day of salvation, which is every day. Now is the day. And you, you, know, you read that now is the day of salvation. Every time you read that, it's now. Right? Just like, you know, stores that are like tomorrow is free tacos, right? It's always going to say tomorrow, right? Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Well, every time you read this, it's now, 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 now. It's not tomorrow. It's not next week. It's not, it's not this forever, never going to get to it. Now. Now is the day of salvation. We need to be ready. And that's why verse 1 starts off in chapter 6. We then, as workers together with him. With who? With Jesus Christ. We're workers together with God. He's using us. We're yielding ourselves as these human instruments to bring the gospel, to reconcile people unto Christ. He's working through us. We're workers together with him. We beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Hey, if you're saved today, don't let that just be in vain to do nothing with the rest of your life. Be a worker together with him. Created, you know, his workmanship created unto good works. Let's do the works that he has prepared for us to do. You know, after he saved your soul, now get to work. Of course, verse 2, we read that. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Verse number 3, 
giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. We have this job of being ambassadors. We have this job of being a minister. We have this job of working together with Jesus Christ. So now he's saying, you know what? Don't give offense. This is a good reason to clean up your life. Get the sin out of your life so you're not someone that could be looked on just with all of these offenses and people could look on and say, oh yeah, I don't want to listen to that guy. Do you see what he does and what he says and all this stuff that he looks at? You know, because then they're going to blame the ministry. Oh, he's going out trying to save souls. Okay? We don't want to bring a slander to the ministry. So we need to keep ourselves, these vessels, as pure as we possibly can so that we don't give offense in anything. Verse 4, But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God in, look at this, much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, through all these different things. We need to know how to carry ourselves, how to hold ourselves, how to deal with these things so that we can be the ministers of God and not bring offenses unto the cause of Christ. To be the most effective soul winner that we can be. If you want your loved ones and your family to get saved, take heed to these things because you want to have the best opportunities you can have. Now, take the, don't say, well, I need to become a better soul winner before I'm going to bring up the, you know, the gospel of someone. You can't do that. Now is the time. Wherever you're at, don't wait until you become better at it. Just try to give them the gospel now because you know what? If they don't receive it and if you fail, continue to improve. But then the next opportunity you have, use that as well. And then the next opportunity, use that again. And, then the next, you, know, and you should be getting better and, and, and cleaning up and, and being used more. And, and you know, maybe one time, if, if God allows that there's more opportunities to be had, then praise God. But you don't know if you'll ever have any of those opportunities. That's the point. So you shouldn't just wait until you know all of this stuff. Well, this person's a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, and I need to study all this stuff before I can give them that. Look, the gospel is the same gospel for everybody. Don't put it off. Don't feel like you have to learn all these other things about them in order to give them the gospel. Just give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as I mentioned, along the way, you can pick up some things here and there and then bring it up again. And then bring it up again. When, when every time you have the opportunity, because it is that important, it is that urgent. There's urgency. We're, we're here for a short time. There's an urgency to reach, reach people. Let's keep reading here. So he mentioned... You know, having much patience in afflictions, where you're being afflicted, people are, are doing bad things to you. In necessities, you're in need, you don't, you don't have everything that you need. In distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults. So again, being, being beaten and in prison for doing the work of God. In tumults and labors and watchings and fastings. By pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness by the Holy Ghost, by love of pain. So notice this, this um, contrast between all of these you know, bad things happening to you, necessities, distresses, stripes, imprisonments, all these things happening to you that will wear on you. Well, how do we handle those things? With patience, with pureness, with knowledge, with long-suffering, with kindness. These are the attributes of your character, of your spirit that you need to be working on and walking in the spirit uh, it's by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. Un unfeigned means you're not faking it. You actually love people. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold, we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful, yet alway rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. The life of a soul winner. Interesting life. But what a great life to have in the midst of all these bad things to have so many, so much good associated. That we're saying, you know, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. When bad things are happening in your life, isn't it great to be able to, to still be able to rejoice? 
as poor yet making many rich? Hey, I'm poor, I don't have much, but you know what? I'm able to help other people out and, and, and make them rich. And I believe this is talking about spiritually rich. This isn't just talking about your physical goods. As having nothing yet possessing all things. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? And this is why we don't just um, do these real big ecumenical events. Just all in the name of soul winning or all in the name of whatever, joining hands with people. He's saying, you know what? If people are unbelievers, we don't, we don't, we're not going to do anything with them. We're not going to go out and try to get the, well, let's just, if we just got everyone that calls themselves Christians out soul winning and knocking on doors, no. You know how many of those people aren't even saved? What communion at light with darkness? Don't yoke up with them. We don't, we don't need to do anything with them in the name of something because they're not even um, bringing the right gospel. What agreement, verse 16, hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and the Lord, and touch not the same thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter number 12. Luke chapter 12. I think the main focus and the point that, I'm, that I'm, I want to get across, there's so many people here that do a great job of, of making the time to go out soul winning and being a blessing and loving other people, people that you don't even know, knocking on doors and trying to give the gospel. People have a great heart of doing that. But as I mentioned before, I think, I think sometimes where many of us lack is in trying to have these same conversations with people that we know, with loved ones. And, and because we might have more interaction with people, feeling like that urgency isn't there and, and ignoring, well... I'll wait for a better time to bring it up. Or I'll wait, you know, it didn't come up now, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait the next time. You don't know if there's going to be a next time. You just don't know. I hope so. But take every opportunity that you have. Luke chapter 12, verse number 19. This is an attitude that many people have in the world. Going back to some same person. Right in their, in their view of the world. Uh, and I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Just living like, oh yeah, like, I've got everything set. I built bigger barns. I'm able to store all my goods. And now I'm going to be able to just kick back, relax, and just be on easy street. My retirement plan's just about to kick in. And I've been paying into that. And I'm set and it's good to go. This is the attitude, right? Verse 20, But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? You don't know the day. and some, It could be the very day you retire. Or whatever, right? I mean, like in this guy's case, he's saying, you're going to die tomorrow. Your soul's going to be required of you. And you've put all this work and all this effort and all these other things and never took the time to get your soul right and be reconciled unto God. And now the time has come. That's the attitude that many unsaved people have. They care about their physical comfort, but not their spiritual comfort. They put that off. But on the flip side, we need to make sure that we're not putting off the gospel presentation that we need to be giving to our family members that we know need to hear it. The people that you know are not saved. They need to hear the gospel. I think it's better. I think you'll sleep better at night and, and your conscience will be clear. If you keep bringing up the gospel to someone you know is not saved that ends up not wanting to have anything to do with you, but you've been trying and trying and trying, then 
if you never bring it up and you have all these opportunities with someone and then they end up dying and going to hell and you know they go to hell because you know they never got saved and you just don't bring it up to them. Take the opportunities. Don't be like the guy that says, oh, well, you know, I'm going to do this and do that. I'm going to focus on everything else and not this person. We don't know what's going to be on tomorrow. Turn, if you would, please, to Acts chapter number 8. It's the last place I'll have your turn. It's going to be a shorter sermon this evening. Acts chapter number 8. Now is the time to act. Now is the time to get things done. Now is the day of salvation. Acts chapter 8, famous story, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. We're going to see Philip and how responsive he is to the Holy Spirit, to God, to, to, to the direction, to soul winning, to doing things. When, when the Spirit's leading him to go and talk to people, he does it. He does it. He does it. He acts. He moves on it. He does it right away. He doesn't miss an opportunity. There's a guy in a chariot way over there. What does he do? He runs. We're going to see that. You know, there's, there's all these different opportunities. And you read through the whole book of Acts and what's happening. These guys are going soul winning and just making, making things happen, making opportunities happen. Paul's at, at, in Athens. And he sees these people all just given to idolatry. And as his manner is, he speaks up and he's just like, hey... <laughs> You got to stop worshiping these idols. You, know, these, you have all these monuments and statues to all these other gods here. You've got one I saw to the unknown God. Well, I'm going to tell you about the unknown God, the one that you guys don't seem to know anything about. There's a real God, a God in heaven, and he, you know, and he preaches unto him. He tells him about it, and he seizes the opportunity. Even while he's just waiting for his fellow laborers to show up, other people to come before he really gets started, he's like, I can't wait. Because that's what his manner is. He's going to go and, and just, just start preaching. And we ought to have that same spirit about us. Don't wait. Just do. Get, get the gospel out there. There's no reason to wait. Look at Acts chapter 8. We're going to start reading verse number 26. The Bible says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for the worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. So we see this, this scene painted for us. This Ethiopian man, he was a eunuch, but it says he was a eunuch of great authority under the queen of the Ethiopians. The chariot that he was riding in I would imagine, I would guess, when we get this level of information of who this guy is, was probably not your, your clunker chariot, right? He probably didn't have one wheel falling off and a hubcap missing and the gas cap open, miss, you know. <laughs> it was probably a nice ride. Probably a decent chariot if he's in this level of position. Here's one thing that Philip doesn't do. Oh, forget that. I, I mean, this guy's just going to shoot me down. This rich guy, he's not going to want to hear what I have to say. Is that what he does? No. He's coming there. The Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Verse 30. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet. I said, Understand this all what I read? Oh, he ran. Spirit said, hey, go, go talk to that guy. Boom, I'm off. And he's doing it. He's not thinking his carnal mind going, this guy's never going to listen to me. And that's one of the biggest detriments to soul winning when people just have this preconceived idea, well, that person I got sold to me. Look, it's, I understand I've had, I have those thoughts too, but the problem is when you then allow that to, to change your action and then not go soul winning and talk to those people. It's one thing to have the thought, but then you still go and do it anyways and do it willingly and you go and run to them and love that person and still try to get them saved. But don't let that just, uh, ah, forget that, I'll skip that. Skip that door. 
skip that whole area, part of town, we're never gonna go there because it's only rich people. Look, we, we can't have that attitude because you don't know. You don't know a person's heart. You don't know where they're at. This guy's reading the Bible. He probably would have thought, oh, this guy's not gonna have anything to do with it. I've walked up on people you know, that, that look real thuggish and gangster looking. They're blasting their rap music and they've got their rides out there and they've got a beer in their hand going, these guys are probably not going to want to have anything to do with me. And you build up in your mind what you think they're going to say. And I've had people like that get saved. Yeah, amen. Hey, can I show you? Sure. Wait, what did you say? <laughs> did you say yes? As you're like already, hey, can I share with you that, <laughs> like walking away as, as you're even just trying to approach him? Don't be like that. Okay, look, everybody needs to hear the gospel. Amen. We need to bring the gospel to everyone and don't allow these, these ideas. Even people who you think are hardened in your family or friends or people that you know. Man, I know they've, they've grown up this certain way. They're never going to want to listen to me. You don't know what's going on in their mind and in their heart and in their spirit. You don't know. Maybe something else has been going on that's got them thinking already, and this could be the perfect opportunity, but you're like, yeah, they're not going to listen anyway, so we'll just talk about everything else when I have this perfect opportunity with someone. Don't let the opportunity pass you by. Please, it is urgent. Now, I think everybody has probably passed up opportunities because that happens. I know I've passed up plenty of opportunities. I'm not happy about it, but we can't, you know, you have today. You have, to, you know, maybe you have tomorrow, but you have today. Every day that you have is a day that you have to be able to give someone the gospel. So don't, you know, you can't do anything about chances you already missed. It's over. It's done with. It's gone. People you could have gotten to give the gospel to that passed on, there's nothing you can do about that anymore. But all you can do is with what you have every single day that you have. And don't let a day pass you by. Because people need to hear the gospel, just as the Ethiopian eunuch said when Philip said, hey, do you, know what you're, do, you, do you even understand what you're reading there? He's reading the Bible. He's reading the scripture. He said, how can I except some man should guide me? Don't say people don't know. They need you. They need you to show them how to be saved, to explain to them, to give them the gospel, to explain, hey, well, you're reading the Bible there. Look, the Bible says this. This is what it means. It's real simple. It means exactly what it says, but God requires us to be involved in the salvation of people, you know, being reconciled unto him. It's the way that he made it. The Holy Ghost is involved when he uses a spirit-filled person to give the gospel, to plant the seed, and for that seed to be able to It's a job that's done to us. It's an important job. We're ambassadors. Let's take it seriously. Let's not have wasted opportunities. The time is short. Now is a day of salvation. Don't put off for tomorrow what you can do today. And, and don't get these presuppositions in your mind about how someone's going to react. You don't know. I know multiple people who have been very faithful soul winners out soul winning other people as well as within their own family. I know people that have brought the gospel up every chance they've had with their own parents who have been hard cases. And you know what? With people who are diligent like that I've noticed way more often than others, their family ends up getting saved. They bring it up, they bring it up, they bring it up. Now, sometimes someone might shun you for that. I get it. But you cannot operate under that fear either. If you think, well, well they might not want to have a, any, you know, ever want to talk to me again if I do this. So I'm not going to bring it up. Well, then what's the point? It's better to take the chance and take the risk of them not wanting to talk to you anymore, but actually being able to get the gospel out there, than it is to maintain this surface level relationship where you never get deep enough to talk about the things of God and, and 
have any real benefit or value to that relationship because they're still going to die and go to hell if they're unsaved. And as I mentioned before, you don't know. Don't, don't withhold opportunity from someone else because you think they won't receive it. Who are you to make that decision for them? When you have the good news, you know the answer, you know God, you know how salvation works, who are you to withhold that from somebody? Because I don't think they're ready yet. Leave it up to them to make those types of decisions. At least then you can say, hey, my, my hands are pure from the blood of all men. Pure. I, I did my best. I didn't waste opportunities. Every chance I had, I gave them the gospel. You know, if people are getting irritated, they don't want to hear it, they don't want to hear it, they don't want to hear it. Well, you know what? I love you, I love you, I love you. I want you to hear this. Who knows? Maybe getting shut down multiple times, but your persistence will actually mean something to them. You don't know. Maybe it will. Maybe it'll finally get through. But man, fine, I'll just listen to you. You don't know. All we can do is do what we're told of God and not start playing what we determine to be the best. Oh, I'll just wait till... No. The Bible says now is a day of salvation. Let's never forget that and never waste opportunities that you have. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for saving our souls. Thank you for the great gift that you've bestowed upon us, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to, uh, to stay humble and, and to not get uh, too lifted up in ourselves and our own thought process, Lord. Help us to just be able to um, do, what, do what you've told us to do by preaching the gospel. And um, Lord, I, I pray that you would please help us as, as your ambassadors to uh, get the sin out of our life, that, that the ministry wouldn't be blamed by, by, thing, by our shortcomings and our failings, Lord, help us to be able to uh, possess our, our vessels in honor here. And God, we, we want to do this work, and I pray that you will please help us, especially as we go to the lost, uh, the, the random strangers and people we don't know to, to bring the gospel to them, Lord. I pray that you please just help our, our, uh, our families and help us to have the boldness and the courage to, to reach our families, Lord. And, and if we have family members that won't listen to us, they just simply won't do it, God, I would pray that you would please help us to, uh, that you would just send other soul winners their way uh, that, they, that they would listen to as we go out and, and reach other people's families. God, uh, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.